Well, so Paul Collier, thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat with me today about the issue of um, migration. And to get us started, uh, let me ask you, how would you characterize the migration issue today? Uh, how has it become such a hot topic and, and how do you think it's, gonna, it's likely to develop uh, in the future? Well, at the moment, obviously, um, uh, public policy on migration um, and refugees is a complete mess. It's a broken system. In fact, it doesn't really deserve the word system. Um, how's it got into such a mess where we're changing policy week by week? That, incidentally, is a symptom of a totally broken system that you have to change policy week by week. It's unsustainable. Um, how do we get there? by incredibly irresponsible short-term uh, political decisions um, uh, uh, by the major figures of Europe, most prominently uh, Chancellor Merkel, um, who um, uh, has uh, uh, first um, uh, pretty well ignored the uh, refugee problem when it started in 2011, um, uh, woke up to it in a panic in 2015, um, um, very irresponsibly then unilaterally opened the door, um, thinking only 10,000 people would come. Um, uh, and then um, six months later, unilaterally slammed the door again by doing an incredibly expensive deal with Erdogan, um, such a nice man, uh, and, uh, and then uh, attempted to uh, coerce other European countries to taking um, the refugees that she unilaterally let in. Um, this is astoundingly irresponsible. Um, so, of course, um, European policy is in a mess at the moment. It couldn't be anything else. Um, uh, there's no reason it should be in a mess. There's, there's very straightforward policies that will be sustainable. And that's what we've got to get to, is we've got to build some sustainable policies. And before we get to the policies, I mean, I know that you've done a lot of work, especially on, on Africa and development uh, uh, economics. Um, what do you think, uh, beyond obvious uh, sources of refugees such as wars, what, what, what are the key drivers of migration and, and how do you think they're going uh, to develop in the future? Is this issue going to solve itself to an extent or is it likely to get worse? Well, I think, we, first of all, we've got to distinguish very sharply between migration and refugees. Um, refugees um, are a, um, a subcomponent of people who are displaced um, from their homes. And by definition, the people who are displaced are people who chose not to migrate. Okay? So refugees, by definition, are people who don't want to migrate. Mm -hmm. okay? So they're not migrants. That's right? so the first point. Um, most people who are displaced manage to find somewhere else within the, the same country. And then they're classified as internally displaced people, about 65 million worldwide. Um, about a third stagger over the nearest border and so legally become refugees. But nearly all uh, in uh, regional havens, just in effect, next door to the conflict. Uh, there are 10 regional havens worldwide where most refugees are. Right? So that is the refugee problem, is, um, is, is providing for the refugees in those regional havens. Like most refugees in Syria are in Lebanon or in, in the... They're in Lebanon, they're in Turkey, uh, and they're in Jordan. Alex and I got involved in all this because we were jointly called in to Jordan. Jordan had nearly a million refugees had been left to, to hang out to dry. Right? Your problem. Turkey, Turkey, two million, got no help, virtually no help. Right? These were absurdly irresponsible European responses. Um, and uh, 
so that was the heart of the 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 refugee failure was a failure um, to uh, respond to the crisis in situ. Um, now we, there is this agency UNHCR, which was designed for a completely different context. Beginning of the nineteen fifties, coming out of the problems of the late nineteen forties, and so its um, solution was. Um, tented camps with free food, free accommodation. And that had made sense in the late 1940s in Europe. And by the time you get to modern refugee situations, it doesn't. 90% of refugees worldwide ignore the whole UNHCR system because it's not what they want. What they want is to restore autonomy. Imagine you'd been, you'd had to flee your home. You want to restore autonomy, you want to restore your community. And the easiest place to do that is to go to a town. Mm-hmm. This is what most refugees do. Find a job in a town. Now, re- the Syrian refugees coming to Jordan, in one sense, were in paradise. Um, same religion, same language. Um, uh, the big difference was that Jordan per capita, is over six times richer than Syria. So if a Syrian could get a job in Jordan, they're doing very well. They've, they've reached heaven. You know? That became a hell of a problem for the government of Jordan because the government of Jordan couldn't allow people to, the Syrians to undercut Jordanians. The Syrians would have been willing to deeply undercut the Jordanians, and that would have produced a big reaction, political reaction, understandably, on the part of the Jordanians. So understandably, the Jordanian government said, you can have haven here, but you can't work. And what Alex and I came up with was a strategy, if we can make this work for both the Jordanians and refugees, um, would you agree to let refugees work? And uh, the idea was um, Europe would bring jobs in, both for refugees and for Jordanians. Mm-hmm. And the Jordanians themselves said, well, we'll, we'll split it, let's split it, 70 jobs for refugees for every 30 for Jordanians. Right? Um, and they said, if you can do that, if you can get jobs to come here, firms to come here, because we desperately need firms. We're stuck in the middle income trap. We need firms. If you can get firms to come in, we'll issue up to 200,000 work permits. That would have been a job for every refugee family. So your idea was basically to align incentives. Yes, of course. But but the country like uh, Jordan, stuck in the middle income trap. Yeah, absolutely crazy to wag your finger and say you should give them jobs. just make some. We can make globalization work by bringing jobs to refugees where they are. And um, Europe and Germany, in particular, was superbly equipped to do that. Germany is the place par excellence with firms that are operating in the region. So, hundreds of thousands of jobs in Turkey have been generated by German firms over the years. That hasn't cost Germany jobs. On the contrary, this raised productivity in Germany because the less skilled jobs, the less productive jobs have been moved to Turkey. Um, So this is globalization at its best. And instead, um, uh, you know, UNHCR, their response to us was, well, we're not a jobs agency. We don't do jobs for refugees. We do free food and tents. And that's the problem. People don't want free food and tents for 10 years. They want a job. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, first of all, there's an institutional dysfunction because the UN agency was set up for something completely different. Yeah, that's right. So they've just not got the skill set to do this. Yeah. 
And the policy makers are, are not on the same page either because they see there's some sort of help and maybe just cutting deals of keeping them away from their own borders rather than trying exactly. to empower them exactly. uh, where exactly. they could rebuild exactly. a life. Exactly. I mean, what does, when, when um, Merkel flew to Turkey, what was the deal? Um, you know, you take one, we'll take, we take one back. As if the currency um, is, uh, you know, we don't want these people that you take them and we'll take some other people you don't want. Um, and that is you know, both a disgusting formulation, um, but absolutely, absolutely misses the opportunity that we can make the global economy work in the interests of the most desperate people on earth, mm -hmm. who are the refugees displaced from their homes. And you, at the beginning of the conversation, you made a distinction between displaced people, refugees, and other sources of migration because they're yeah, not migrants. Of course, there are lots of people who are aspirational migrants. Yeah. And if you dangle a big enough carrot in front of a refugee, you can turn them into a migrant. You know, you say, come to a scholarship at Harvard or come to California, then a lot of refugees. In, uh, in, in Jordan would turn into migrants. They wouldn't be refugees still. Refugee status, what it demands is the restoration of a degree of autonomy and a safe haven. Um, the obvious, once you've got that, you know, once Jordan's providing that, um, refugee status isn't a meal ticket to um, go live anywhere on earth. Mm -hmm. um, I could double my income if I moved to Norway. Right? I don't see why, uh, and and most of the population of the world would increase their income by much more than double. Um, there's no right to that. It's actually very sad if people define themselves by an aspiration to get out of their country. And inadvertently, Europe is in danger of doing that with Africa. 90% of my time is working with African governments. Yeah. You know? And their nightmare is that their young people are starting to get this narrative that hope lies in getting out. I'm working with the government of Ghana, very fine government, president, vice president, finance minister, very good. You know? Better than most of Europe's top three. Um, uh, Ghana's growing at 9% last year. Right? They're doing a good job. There's no way that uh, the government of Ghana can create economic opportunities that are better this year than getting a job in Europe. No way. Right? That, that doesn't mean we've got a right to lure the brightest and best young Ghanaians to Europe. They need it in Ghana. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so inadvertently, people think that they're performing some great morally noble act by saying, welcome to Europe, luring bright young people away from their real obligations and opportunities within Africa uh, to come and lead frustrated lives on the streets of Rome, right? which mm -hmm. is what the reality is. Yeah, I mean, you said these are sort of pull factors that, that yeah, Europe yeah. sort of dangles the carrots. Yeah. But, but I mean, the, the concern, at least right you wrongly, in many policymakers, is that there are push factors uh, at work in, in Africa as well. And there are. And that's yeah. why um, I've been part of two big initiatives the last year. Last year, I worked with the German government, with uh, the then finance minister Schäuble, who I greatly respected. Um, we travelled together to Africa uh, to launch uh, compacts with Africa. The compact with Africa is a programme. It's now got 10 African countries um, who've joined it. Um, and it's pitched at uh, the, the best-run countries in Africa. So, for example, Ghana immediately joined up. Mm -hmm. um, so did Morocco. Um, and uh, so did Rwanda. Uh, Ethiopia, what they, what they, and what's the objective of the Compact with Africa? It's to get European firms and other G20 firms to go to Africa, bring jobs to Africa. Right? 
such as yeah. Volkswagen recently opened a car plant in Rwanda. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's exactly the right thing to do. Make globalization work for people. The humane form of globalization is bring jobs to people, not lure people across the sea to jobs, which very often don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the, the humane strategy. Public policy should be making globalization work for African societies. And, in, and we can do that by the million. Africa needs jobs by the million. And instead, we're luring Africans by the thousand to get into boats. And that is deeply irresponsible and unethical. So because once Africans get to Europe, they discover the reality. But they're trapped. Because to go back and face your friends is to be humiliated. Humiliated as a failure. As a failure. Has to come exactly. back. Didn't make exactly. It. Exactly. And so we are um, parading ourselves as aren't we good and actually being deeply unethical. And where do you think this narrative then comes from, that sort of the, widespread, the perception that might be widespread that, you know, in order to make it, you have to move to Europe because there might be the good jobs. But, I mean, are the European countries themselves to blame for, you know, establishing their Yes, I think so. I think you know, a lot of European NGOs, this incessant stuff of uh, give money, you know, give money to Africa, incessant, the begging bowl image of Africa, mm -hmm. as if what Africa needs is entitlements to consumption, which the noble charities provide. What Africa needs is empowered production, not entitled consumption. It doesn't need our charity, it needs our firms. You know, in trying to get firms to go to Jordan to employ refugees, we talked with a lot of firms. Do you know what the number one obstacle was? What was that? The firms feared that if they went in and employed refugees, the European NGOs would accuse them of uh, running sweatshop labor, exploiting refugees. And so the NGOs that claimed to be so, you know, the big defenders of refugees were actually the big problem. And this was, you know, this is, again, it's ethically disgraceful. And these NGOs need to be shamed so that their behavior is actually called out. Yeah. So presumably you can obviously do both. You can create jobs that are, are decent in terms of working conditions and standards. Of course. But, you know, frankly, if you're a Syrian, as I say, who even before the conflict was on $2,000 a year, average for Syria, and you're working in Jordan, average $13,000 a year, pretty well any job is going to seem great, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, we were bringing proper firms into industrial zones which would meet legal requirements in Jordan and so be fabulous jobs for a, a, a Syrian. Um, so there's no issue about labor standards and so on. Not at all. It's a totally spurious concern. Um, uh, instead, what happened was um, we got a... Less than 5% of Syrians moved to, to Germany, um, but highly selective who moved to Germany, uh, young, well-off men. Um, so between approximately 40% of all the Syrians with university degrees are now in Germany. How many percent? 40%. 40%. So less than 5% of the population but around 40% of, of graduates. Exactly the people who will be needed to rebuild Syria. Right? This is so irresponsible. It needs to be called out. Right? And, and if you're, if I understand you correctly, if your solution is, or the beginning of a solution, is to turn the whole mechanism around, saying basically it is about economic development in, in the region, how do you explain yourself? What is your explanation for why uh, the refugee issue in particular has become such a polarizing issue in, in Europe. Um, because it's been not thought through. We've had policymakers who haven't done their job of actually thinking long term what would 
be a sensible long-term policy. Instead, they seem to have reacted week by week or even day by day to events. And if you just take short-term decisions driven by short-term events, you get deeper and deeper into a mess. Right? Um, the, um, and into nitty-gritty details and the grand scheme of things don't mean much, such as the recent spat in whether you should send secondary uh, migrants back for, at the Bavarian border. I mean, these are just short-term reactive things. We should start by saying, what will a sustainable policy look like? Once you, and I believe that we can very rapidly build a very broad consensus across both the left and the right on what a sustainable policy will look like. And it's sustainable policy but I think have three features. One is it will be ethical. It will meet our ethical duties towards refugees and towards uh, the people in poor countries who desperately need credible hope. They need opportunity. Mm -hmm. so, and what exactly are these duties? How would you sort of... So the duties towards refugees are we must show solidarity. Right? So... In 2011, when there's a huge refugee flight out of Syria, that is a European responsibility as well as a Jordanian, Turkish, and Lebanese responsibility. We must show solidarity. But we join solidarity with the principle of comparative advantage. You, Jordanians, do what you do best. Keep your borders open and provide safe haven and allow people to work, we'll do what we do best. Make it in your interest as Jordanians to allow all that to happen and we will bring the jobs that provide refugees with autonomy and will provide the money that make it viable for Jordan. You know, we didn't. I mean, Jordan's budget deficit exploded because it was paying for those refugees um, unhelped. Um, so that's the, the ethical duty to refugees. The ethical duty to people who live in societies without credible hope is to bring credible hope. Now, Compact with Africa is about the top end. Um, I've just um, co-directed a new commission which reported in April um, called um, Escaping the Fragility Trap, mm -hmm. which is about what to do with the, 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 the highly stressed end of the spectrum not just in Africa, but worldwide. They're the societies which are generating the refugee. Um, and the um, so you can all just Google escaping the fragility trap, and there's a hard-hitting report. Um, I was in Berlin last week um, uh, speaking about it to the German government, um, and there's very clear things we can do which we've not been doing. Very the clear. main things being? Well, so one is um, economic and one is political. Um, the, uh, the economic thing is, remember, you know, that Clinton phrase, it's the economy stupid, you know? Um, the only way long term to lift out of fragility is to, to grow the economy, to grow economic opportunities. There are desperately, desperately few firms in fragile states because why on earth would a decent firm go there? Right? But there's a chicken huge, and egg problem. Yeah, yeah, but there's a huge public interest in getting firms to go there, and so we need public money to bring firms into fragile states, not big firms, not firms that'll export, just firms that will organise people in groups of more than two. You know, most mm -hmm. most Africans in fragile states work on their own solo, no scale, no specialisation very low productivity, doomed to poverty. The basic thing that a firm does anywhere is organizing is people. Organize people in scale and specialization. And so paying, using public money to bring decent firms into environments where they'd rather not go, but are desperately needed, that is the use of public money that's, that's important. Um, and all our governments have agencies that deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's the part of the aid program or aid agency 
that deals with the pub, with with the firms. So um, in uh, in Germany, that's DEG, which is a part of KFW. Yeah. Right? In Britain, it's CDC, which can get its money from DFID. In the World Bank Group, it's IFC, which at last is getting money from aid. Uh, until last year, IFC had to make a profit to pay for the, the public aid program. And that was crazy. So if you've got to make a profit, you invest in China. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, a complete denial of purpose, misunderstanding of what these agencies are for. There are 45 development finance institutions around the world, public agencies with public money to get firms to do things. And many of them have not yet understood their true purpose. We're convening all of them jointly with IFC um, here in Oxford in February um, to try and just get new sense of purpose. Yeah. I mean, like setting financial incentives that in other areas work quite well. I mean, I've just built a house on the outskirts of Berlin and the KFW gives you concessional credit lines and straightforward subsidies if you build according to certain environmental standards. Exactly. So the, the tools are there. The tools are there. Let's use them. Okay. Exactly. I mean, this is not that difficult, frankly. Um, it's just that we've had these institutions for years and not used them. Mm -hmm. and, why do, the right and why do you think that is? Because policy hasn't been joined up. You know? Refugee policy has always been given to UNHCR. When I expect when I first went into Jordan, my first thought, because I used to work for the World Bank directing research department, was, what's the World Bank doing? Where is it? I went back to the, my friends at the World Bank um, and they said, Paul, you've forgotten. We're not in Jordan. It's an upper-middle income country, so we're not there. And there's a million refugees. They said, no, no, no. If, if it's refugee, it's UNHCR. So I, I challenged my friends, let's take it to the board. So they took it to the board. The board unanimously agreed that they changed policy and they created a $2 billion program every three, so it's $2 billion every three years mm -hmm. for work in the Haven countries, bringing economic opportunity, both to refugees and to uh, local citizens, where they're providing Haven. Um, that's now pumping big money into Jordan um, and into Lebanon. And it, yeah, that's a sensible strategy. So things have woken up. If they'd been running like this for 20 years, the Syrian crisis would have played out very differently. Mm. But so there is a lot of institutional inertia where the institutions just either are not sort of designed to respond to this or not, not in, in their own view in charge or... or yes. Yeah. I mean, they just... Um, um, the migration people, when you talk to migration people, I had two European officials here yesterday, um, and when you talk to them about the need to get firms into, uh, you know, in, into, into fragile states and that their own countries have agencies which could do that, um, they look amazed. You know, they write it down and they'll go and do something. But it never occurred to them. It never occurred to them. They're migration people. And so they think, what should we do with Africa? We should say, if you take your people back, we'll take other people. In other words, migration for migration. A trade. It's, yeah. it's, they just put it into a damn box of migration and, and are not, not understanding that you've got to think outside that box. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a complete lack of joined up policy making yes. and, and thinking. Yes. Okay, let's use that opportunity then, at least where, where we have a, a polity, a framework in the European Union. Um, you're running up mm. into the European election next Absolutely. year. And obviously, um, the refugee issue and migration in general, I mean, we're, we're in Oxford, we're in the UK, where EU freedom of movement is, has been a big issue recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, these issues, you know, uh, asylum policy, refugees, freedom of movement and non-EU migration will be, will be big issues. So if you were a advising European policymaker, what, I mean, we've already touched on some of this, but, but what would be a good policy mix? You know, what, what kind of measures would you put in place immediately in the medium term and long term to deal with a lot of these pressures? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, um, Alex and I are advising on European migration and refugee policies. So, uh, um, and um, our starting point is it's 
we've got, we've got a polarized debate because um, people are fighting over the wrong things. And that actually, once we shift focus from what do we do tomorrow to what would be a sustainable system, there'd be very widespread agreement. Um, and as, just to summarize, the widespread agreement starts from whatever we do has got to be ethical. And that means it's got to meet our duties to refugees, which we do by bringing jobs to refugees and providing big support for the governments of haven countries so that those borders stay open. That's vital. Mm -hmm. If there's no if, if it's not to the advantage of the haven societies, they won't keep their borders open. And then you get the dreadful pressure cooker of displaced people not able to get out. Yeah. Um, the other ethical duty is to bring opportunities to countries that where there's a dangerous narrative developing that the only thing you can do is get out. You know, my whole working life for over 40 years has been dedicated to the idea um, the poor societies have got to catch up with us. They don't catch up with us by being drained of their brightest and best people. I've got a student at the moment who's a Sudanese doctor. I'm not teaching him medicine, I'm teaching him public policy because he wants to go back and work in the prime minister's office in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And you know, his friends, other Sudanese doctors in Britain think he's crazy. Um, there are more Sudanese doctors in London than in the whole of the Sudan. That is it's an, it's an ethical disgrace that Britain has run a health service in which it's recruited Sudanese doctors rather than train doctors here. Right? Britain has three of the top 10 universities in the world. Africa doesn't have any. The idea that we need African trained doctors is absurd. Right? Africa needs British trained doctors. Right? Now, there's a whole political story of why mm -hmm. Britain chose to undertrain. It's something to do with the trades union for British doctors who found it very advantageous to keep their numbers of British doctors very small. So they got the plum jobs. Huh? But the idea that it is anything to celebrate that we've had a lot of immigration of Sudanese doctors, that is just manifestly false. It is shaming that Europe runs its policy like that. So, um, we meet our duties, ethical duties. Ethical duties. Then we have to run a policy which gets broad democratic endorsement, that the majority of people say, yeah, this is fine. Right? If you try and run a policy that most people in your society um, think is irresponsible, um, you, you tear up your democracy. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening. You, you, Governments around Europe have lost the trust of citizens, very measurably. That's a disaster, because government, to function, depends on trust. Not just in this area of migration, but in, any in general area. terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the third criterion uh, is that we should run policies which are sufficiently precautionary that we don't end up regretting them. Yeah? Well, would that but for instance, mean in practice? Can you give some well, examples? Well, at the moment, if you asked, if you did a, did a survey, um, do you think there's been too much migration? Um, you know, what would be your guess? Well, there are these surveys, yeah. and uh, it is high up on the on the list of people uh, what people are concerned about. Yeah, so there's a regret, right? So it means we run policies in a way that people don't end up in 10 years' time saying we would regret that. Right? That means we don't regret um, uh, leaving refugees stuck in, uh, in camps with no jobs, um, uh, that young Africans coming to Rome don't regret having done it, that we don't run a health system in Britain dependent on Sudanese doctors and find that 
Sudanese are, uh, have got a high mortality rate because there are no doctors. You know, these are the no regrets stuff. Right? Um, so those are the three. Right? Once you, once you, I believe there's a very large majority of people who say, yeah, we want policies that meet those three criteria. And we can broadly agree on what they'll look like. In that system, um, people getting on rubber boats uh, to come across the Mediterranean manifestly has no place whatsoever. Right? That cannot be a sensible part of a sustainable policy on migration. Mm -hmm. and, le and let us finish on this trust point, because yeah. that's, uh, yeah. in a sense, a precondition to yeah. policy yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, because uh, across Europe, we've seen uh, the rise of populist politics and uh, the using that issue and abusing of uh, sentiment uh, to erode trust in the in the political Absolutely. system. So what would be your starting point? Because well, in the run-up to the European election or in the run-up to national elections, the, the fun, uh, one of the fundamental underlying problems is that every mainstream party uh, is, 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 is addressing is how can you regain trust? Yeah. So how would you start with this? Yeah, well, I've just written a whole book on that. It's called, okay. the, it's called The Future of Capitalism, and it comes out beginning of October. And it is about how the center can restore trust. Right? And uh, I believe that the, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid who grew up and benefited from that glorious period, um, 1945 to 70, in which social Europe was built. Um, the, uh, the British National Health Service was started, um, uh, exactly, um, yeah, kind of exactly 70 years ago, uh, 1948, mm -hmm. July. And nine months later, I was born in a National Health Service hospital. I then went to a school which had until um, uh, until two years before I was born, been a private school. Uh, but it was turned into a state school. Right. Okay. I got there. Uh, it was only a high quality state school for 19 years. I got, I got seven of them. <laughs> okay. um, both my parents had left school when they were 12. So without that school, I'd, I'd still be a poor butcher like my dad. Right? Um, and, uh, and then I came to Oxford. My education at Oxford was completely free. Um, because at that time, for poor kids, there were scholarships. There aren't now. I then went on to, uh, graduate work. I got a doctorate in Oxford. And again, that was all free. Because at that time, there was money for it. For, if you were poor enough. Right? Um, I was made by that period. And what was that? What was the defining feature of that period? People built reciprocal, mutual obligations around uh, real anxieties. I think of the. It was the cooperative movement, which was born in the north of England where I grew up. Um, Rochdale, the Halifax Building Society. These are all the towns around where I lived. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Sheffield was the first Labour government, Labour Labour council in the whole of Britain. Right? Um, that was the period when ordinary people and their anxieties were met by this mutual obligations, and the genius of mutual obligations is all the rights you generate are precisely matched by the obligations you generate. Mm -hmm. And then, from about 1980 onwards. All that got dismantled, partly by the lunacy of the right, the sort of Milton Friedman type of agenda. What's good for business is good for everyone, you know, this crazy agenda. And partly by the craziness of the new left, which abandoned the idea of reciprocal obligations, mutual obligations in favor of individual rights and the rights of victim groups and stuff and social paternalism yeah. and so the last 40 years in my view have been a tragedy 
of dismantling the true foundations of social democracy. That's what people are rebelling against. So in that sense, quite interestingly, the solution to the displacement problem and the solution to regaining trust in the domestically is, in a sense, similar. So sort of rebuilding economic incentives around mutual interest Absolutely. and reciprocity. Absolutely. Reciprocity is the big theme of the future of capitalism. Yeah. And, um, and, by, and and it's also there is a, there's a very strong political implication there. I mean, I... About two months ago, I wrote a column for the Süddeutsche Zeitung uh, about Brexit. What I'm worried about, what a lot of commentary seems to miss, is the three major fault lines in Brexit, education, geography, and age, uh, they have one thing in common. It's broadly the net taxpayers and the net tax recipients. And if these two camps are remaining disjointed and, and opposed as they are now, the basis of solidarity, which is the foundation for any welfare state, which is the foundation for any redistributive economic system, in my view, will erode. You'll like the book. <laughs> I like that's the book. The, that's, the, that's exactly my, my own analysis of Brexit. It is, it is a tragedy of uh, we cannot afford polarization into rival ideologies because now more than ever we need a sense of solidarity. The people who are suffering the most need to be able to draw on that social capital, accumulated social capital uh, of, of, of reciprocity, mutual regard. And I hope, Paul Collier, that our conversation has made a small contribution to bringing that kind of issue back onto the political agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>